Well, welcome to worship. What a joy it is to be with you again on this Lord's Day. You know, it is Palm Sunday, and Palm Sunday for me is always a bittersweet Sunday. It is bitter in the sense that the cross is looming, and it's sweet because Jesus is entering in with cheers of victory, and it's a paradox. It's a parade of paradox, and sometimes it rains on our parade, yet God continues to reign over our life's parade. It is a paradox this day, bittersweet, because we cannot be together physically in our church buildings worshiping and celebrating together, but it's still so sweet. It is always sweet when we're able to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. And so it is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it. Come and worship and see and join in with this call to worship. Lift up your heads, O you mighty gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may enter in. Who is this King of glory? It is Christ the Lord, our Savior. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Say, The Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, What are you doing, untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the, king, the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve.
began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit from the vineyard. But they seized him, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. Then he sent another servant to them. They struck this man on the head and treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, others they killed. He had one left to send, a son, whom he beloved. He sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took him and killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Haven't you read this passage of scripture? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders looked for a way to arrest him, because they knew he had spoken the parable against them. But they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. Well, after my dad died in 1999, my mom bought this little house in South Euclid. It was a good move at the time, but after many years and many changes, she had to sell that little house to get out from under all of its financial responsibilities. 
However, with a downturned economy back then and the big housing crisis that caused a ton of foreclosures, nobody was looking to buy. And so for a brief period of time, trying to generate some income, my mom lived in an extension of my sister's new house in Chardon while she rented out her own home back there in South Euclid. Unfortunately, that didn't work out too well because the renters were some really wicked tenants. They absolutely destroyed her house and they never paid the rent. They wouldn't even communicate with my mom and so she had to go through this terrible ordeal of evicting the people. It was a really sad and unpleasant experience and a very difficult lesson for my mom. My mom was not cut out to be a landlord. But when we do look back at those times, we can see that God provided for all of my mom's needs. And it was a blessing when she finally did sell that home just a few years ago. Well, today we look at a lesson in Mark's gospel, which is a parable that is actually told by Jesus. And so once again, we open up the classified ads in Mark's Good News Gazette. And under the for rent section, we read about some other wicked tenants. We just heard Julia read the story that Jesus told to the religious leaders about the man who planted a vineyard and then rented it out to some farmers. And at harvest time, the owner sent some servants to collect the rent, which at that time was some of the fruit of the vine. But we learned and we heard that that no good tenant had seized them and beaten them and rejected them and shamed them and even had some of them killed. And so finally, the owner sent his one and only son whom he loved. Now you would think that the people would surely respect and honor him, but instead we're told that these wicked tenants took his son and had him killed and had him thrown out of the vineyard. Now those folks were some really nasty renters. Well, we know that a parable is a story that is told to shine some light on a situation in order to help understand a deeper truth. And it seems quite obvious what Jesus is talking about in this story. The text even says that the religious leaders knew right away that the parable was being told against them. In this story, the owner, the man who planted the vineyard, appears to be God the Father, and the vineyard is the nation of Israel. The tenants are the religious rulers of the day, and the many servants that were once sent to the vineyard are the prophets of God who had remained faithful, and of course, the one and only Son is Jesus himself. Now the Old Testament prophets had foretold of these events that we're talking about today. In fact, the prophet Isaiah comes to mind as he tells us hundreds of years earlier in what is known as the Song of the Vineyard that God the Father is the one who brought the vine out of Egypt and planted it in Israel. Let me read for you the lyrics to the beginning of Isaiah's Song of the Vineyard found in Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are the garden of his delight. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress." The book of Isaiah foretold of both Israel's judgment and salvation, both their exile and their return. Scriptures in the Old Testament book of Isaiah also talks about God's son who would come to bring righteousness and salvation to the world. And Isaiah is also the one who talks about this suffering servant 
this Son of God in chapter 53, saying that he took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. He was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. He was oppressed and afflicted and he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. Remember, one of the purposes of Mark's gospel is to portray Jesus as this suffering servant of God, the one who was rejected and crucified on our behalf. And there are some other prophets that were sent and rejected before him, right? Some with the names of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and Amos and Micah and Zechariah. In fact, it was Zechariah who foretold of Jesus, the Prince of Peace, entering into the holy city riding on a donkey. You see here from Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion! Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem! Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This triumphal entry into the heart of the vineyard by God's one and only Son is cheered along the way by those who have come into the city for the Passover celebration. It seems to be the perfect time for Jesus to announce that he is indeed the Messiah, especially since it was a time when all of Israel would be gathered there in Jerusalem. It was a place where huge crowds would see him, and, and it would be the perfect time way of proclaiming his mission that was unmistakable and these people they knew about Zechariah's prophecy and so they thought their liberation was at hand because news about Jesus was spreading quickly it was spreading everywhere he had healed multitudes he had performed many miracles that that pointed to his true identity and just recently he raised Lazarus from the dead and so now many people were gathered in the streets of Jerusalem, spreading both their cloaks and these cut branches along the way as a royal pathway for the one who they thought was going to deliver the Jews from Roman oppression. They lined the road praising God and waving palm branches. They screamed, Hosanna, which is a Hebrew expression meaning save that had become an exclamation of praise. Hosanna, and so the air was filled with voices crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Blessed is the king of Israel, Hosanna in the highest. Now these religious rulers, those wicked tenants of the vineyard, they're not too happy about the situation of the coming of the owner's son. They were wicked tenants who should have been bearing and tending good fruit of the vineyard in their study of God's word, but instead they were blinded by their pride and their prejudice, and so they plotted to kill the owner's son, the very living word of God, and to have him thrown out of the vineyard. Now in this ongoing story of my mom's house, there was a time after she moved back in, after the renters were forced out, when a pipe burst while she was away in Florida visiting her sister. And av after she came back, she saw that the water had flooded and demolished the house to the point that it had to be rebuilt on the inside. And at first, the devastation was unbearable and a sense of hopelessness had set in. I'll never forget that first day and that feeling that I had when I went into the house for the first time with my mom and I saw the utter destruction of the flooded house. But in hindsight, it was the best thing that could have ever happened to the house because it was completely gutted and it was rebuilt from the inside out. It was absolutely amazing. And she continued living in that house, that beautiful new house, um, waiting in the, until the time it would sell. And it actually had uh, improved the opportunity for its sale. Here's the point. Here's the point. The devastation of Christ's crucifixion on Friday following that exuberant Palm Sunday, also caused a sense of total helplessness to set in. But in hindsight, it was the greatest thing that could have ever happened because the suffering servant, the owner of the vineyard's one and only son, did rise up. He rose up in victory over the grave, and he ultimately conquered sin and death for all time. I mean, that emotion of that victory still floods my soul this morning with such amazement.
praise God. Oh, my friends, the risen Christ wants to remodel your house. He has planted a vineyard in your heart, and he wants to cultivate it. He wants to produce good and righteous fruit in your life. He wants to completely renovate the living space, the living area that houses your soul. But to do so, you have to allow the owner's son into the vineyard. Right? He cannot be rejected. He wants to take ownership in your heart. And when you allow him to do that by accepting his death and his sacrifice on your behalf, and when you turn your deed over to him, your, the deed of your life to him, then he counters uh, you with an offer of ownership of the heavenly household of God. Right? There will be a mansion built for you over the hill just for you. And we're not talking about some mere rental agreement anymore. You will become an adopted child in the family of God and will immediately be a joint heir to the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was the stone that the builders rejected. But he has become the capstone the very cornerstone of the church. And, you know, you can either stumble over it or you can stand upon its solid foundation. You can reject the owner's son or you can invite him to take up residence in what is actually rightfully his own property anyway. I mean, what kind of tenant will you be? In closing, let me recite some verses from another Old Testament song, a song of Asa found in... Psalm 80, beginning in verse 7. And you know, it's interesting to note that as we enter into this Holy Week, uh, this song was usually set to the ancient biblical tune called the Lilies of the Covenant. The Lilies of the Covenant. Isn't that appropriate? Uh, Psalm 80, beginning in verse 7. It's a song of Asaph, set to the tune, The Lilies of the Covenant. It says to us, Restore us, O God Almighty, and make your face shine upon us, that we may be saved. You brought a vine out of Egypt, and you drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared ground for it, and you took root, and you filled the land. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over the vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you raised up for yourself. Your vine is cut down, it is burned with fire at your rebuke, your people perish. But let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man that you have raised up for yourself, and then we will not turn away from you. Revive us, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord God, and make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O God of heaven and earth, you give to us all that we need. You provide for us all of our needs. And so we give you thanks for sending us Jesus Christ in your name, even though we profess to follow him, we confess that in times of trial we often fail, we often deny him. And so forgive us and heal us, we pray. Help us to put our faith not in this world, but in the Prince of Peace. In Jesus' name, we come to you in prayer. We thank you, O God, that the Lord helps us, that you declare us not guilty. And because of the grace we received in baptism, we have nothing to fear. We are forgiven and we are freed, and so we share the peace of Christ with one another. O oh God, as we enter this Holy Week, strengthen us to move beyond the festive parade of palms and to follow Jesus into the way of the cross that united him with all the faithful, that one day we may enter through these gates of righteousness into the eternal city, the new Jerusalem, where we may praise you with Christ and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. O eternal God, quiet within us our mortal voices, that through the story of the passion 
and the power of your Holy Spirit, we may have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. O oh God, God in the highest, you came to us in a human being who humbled himself like a slave. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. We pray for nations that worship power and might, that they may be ruled by humility and peace, and they may be guided in wisdom. The stone that the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Oh God, we pray for the church and its leaders that we would have the mind of Christ. The stone the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Oh God, we pray for victims of human tragedies and disasters of nature. We pray, O oh Lord, as we uh, handle this crisis that is upon our lives at this time, the stone that the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Oh God, we pray for those who are in prison, literally, emotionally, and spiritually, for those who are repentant and those who are unrepented, even those who are falsely accused, the stone that the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Oh God, we pray for those who are sick, those who are ill and infirmed. We pray for those who are helping those who are sick. We pray for those who are rejected because they are seen to be weak. We pray for those who need your strength. The stone that the builders have rejected has become the chief cornerstone. O oh God of compassion through Jesus Christ, you have come to us and shared our common lot, and so mold us into people who shout and show your mercy, and keep us obedient to him whose name is above all other names. O oh God, you have given us your one and only child. You have planted us in your vineyard, and you cultivate our very souls. Oh, Lord, we thank you that we are able to give to you generously, just as you have given to us. And so we thank you for the great deeds of salvation that you have done and continue to do. Oh, Lord, bless the offerings that come into the church through the mail. And I thank you for those who remain faithful. Use them for your glory, and for the extension of your ministry. Through Christ we pray. Oh, Lord. As we enter into this new day, we ask that you would keep us mindful of the profound nature of this holy week that is upon us. Help us to go beyond the joyful parade of the palms and to follow Jesus into this suffering world, mindful that he was obedient to you, even to the cross. Let us join together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. May you know the love of Jesus Christ the mercy of the Father, and the fire of the Spirit as you go with the one God who loves us all. To the cross, to the grave, and beyond the grave to eternal life forevermore. Amen. Have a great week.